Oh! 
a holy God. His name is higher than any other name. He's seated on the throne. He's in control today. He's got your life within His hands. And today He's working all things together for the good of those that love Him. We read in the Word, it says, so we are, con so we are convinced that every detail of our lives is continually woven together to fit into God's perfect plan of bringing good into our lives. For we are His lovers who have been called to fulfill His designed purpose. You see, church, God is in control. He's always been in control. He will always be in control. And because He is in control, we know that we can rely on Him to bring all things together for the good. And we trust Him that He will do that. It says that when we know that God is always at work for the good for everyone who loves Him, they who are God's, uh, has chosen for His purpose. So to know we know that God is good. We know that God has chosen you for a purpose. We know that God is working everything together. And so we come to Him with humble hearts. We stand before Him and we call out to Him in the different areas where we need Him to work within our lives. But, but when He does this, we know that we can trust that He will always be in control. In Philippians we read that, and I am convinced and sure of this very thing, that he who began a good work in you will continue until the day. Yes, that's something to cheer about, church. Until the day of Jesus Christ, right until the time of his return, developing that good work and perfecting and bringing to full completion in you. That's a God that we want to worship. That's a God we want to praise. That's a God we want to honor today, knowing that He's in control, that He has everything in His hands, that we are, don't have to lack anything, that we don't have to worry about anything, we don't have to be concerned about anything because He's working it all together for the good. So whatever you're facing today, whether it is a financial challenge, whether it's a marital challenge, maybe you've had a loss, maybe you've had heartache, maybe you have a work situation, maybe you have family that have walked away, maybe you need people that need to be saved in your life, there's an addiction that needs to be overcome within your world, whether you need favor or blessing from God today, He's working it all for the good. And so we're gonna pray today. And we're going to pray with hearts that knows that God is working all for the good. We're not going to be anxious. We're not going to stress. We're not going to uh, overly complain about it as the Israelites did. But we're going to trust God today that He'll work it all for the good. And while He's busy doing it, we're going to remain faithful and trust in Him. Father, we are so thankful that You are in control, that You are a great and awesome and a mighty God, Father, that You can do things in an instant that we could never do in our own whole lifetime, Father, that You supernaturally supersede within our lives. And so we bring all those different areas before You, Father, where we are trusting for Your hand to be involved in. We know You love to be involved in our lives, Father, so we lay these things before You. But we lay it before You with hearts that trust in You, Father, hearts that know that You have promised that you will work all things for the good, Father. And so we trust that if we haven't seen a good outcome yet, you're not finished yet, Father. 
and we praise you and we glorify you for this in Jesus' name. Amen. One more time, let's give God a great praise for He is a good God. Praise you, Father. Awesome. Before you sit, high five a few people, greet them. And I want to encourage you that you make at least one people, one person feel really at home today. they're busy with that. I want to welcome you for joining us online. So good to have you join with us, whether you're in the area or maybe further away in the country, or maybe you're over the borders. We are so thankful that you joined us, but we want to encourage you when you're in town or if you're close by, come and join us in the house. There's nothing like being here together. We'd love to welcome you, fellowship with you, and worship God together in the house. So when you get the opportunity, please come and visit. Don't, don't delay. There's nothing better than being here. We invite you to come and join us. Well, welcome to church today. Everyone that's here in the building, it's so good to have you here. Pastor Donovan and Pastor Shelley uh, are on a trip. They are in conferences. Pastor Donovan's actually preaching um, at another church today. And uh, we pray that God will strengthen him and carry him. I know they always covered your prayers. Please keep them in your prayers continually, more so now, but always. Keep them in your prayers and that God will protect them and guard them and lead them. But it is good to be in the house today, right? It's good to be in God's presence. And we want to welcome especially those people that are visiting us today for the first time. We know that every week in every service, we have people that are visiting our church. And whether you came because somebody invited you or whether you saw a billboard or you saw us on the internet or you were just looking for a new church, we are so glad that you joined us today. You are most welcome. We trust that you will come back and get to know us, um, that you will be back again and, and that you will maybe find this as the house where you want to spend time where you want to be planted, where you want to grow, and and we trust that will be the decision that you take today. Welcome that you, uh, for being here, want to remind you that we have our three services at 10, or rather at 8, at 10, 15, and half past 12, and come join us in any one of those services. And I just want to encourage you that if you want to know more about our church, or what's happening in our church, or who we are, what we stand for, what we believe, we have a team. When you go out the doors at the back, you look to the left-hand side, you'll see there's a next step area the team is ready there they're waiting they want to answer your questions so please anything you want to ask or want to know or maybe you've been in our church for a week or two and you want to know what your next step is and what what it is you're going to want to do to grow in our church go visit them they will be able to help you is that all good you guys ready for a great service today can I ask you to turn your attention to the screen church is no better place to be than the house of God and I'm so sad that I'm not able to be in God's house with you today. We are currently traveling abroad and attending one or two conferences and just trusting God that He would just build into our spirits. And today I'm actually preaching in another church. So keep us up in prayer today. Trust God that He would use the Word to touch people's lives. What I want to do today is I want to encourage us when it comes to our giving. It's so important for you and I to have the right perspective about the nature and the character of God and how God has created us and designed us so that we'd be live a fruitful life, live a blessed life. And when we look at creation, the story of creation, the Bible says that before God blessed anything, He brought order to it. And when, we, when God had finished bringing order to something, then He told it to be fruitful, to multiply, and then He blessed it. And as a result of that, there was growth and there was increase. When it comes to our life, and it comes to us being blessed by God in the area of our finances, that same principle applies, that there's got to be an order, a specific order. And that order starts with God. And when we place God first, and we place God as a priority, we place His kingdom and His church in, a, in the right place of our life, then what God does is He blesses us. And so God speaks to us through His Son Jesus when He came down to earth and in the Beatitudes spoke about the importance of the kingdom of God and Jesus explaining how the kingdom of God works. And in the Beatitudes, He starts to speak about the different areas of our life. He starts to speak about prayer, fasting, finances, all of the things that are important and bringing order into our life, that placing God at the, at the pinnacle of our life and right at the top of our uh, list in life that how God blesses our life and Jesus said it like this he said seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and then all these things shall be added to you but Jesus is saying that even though God is fully aware of the things that we need and there's nothing wrong with about having those needs within our life and trusting God and 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 
that those needs would be met in our life and be fulfilled in our life. The reality is, is that it starts with first seeking God. It's bringing that order back into our life of putting God first, seeking God, seeking His kingdom, living a life that God calls us to. And what does that look like for you and I? It looks like that with our finances, that is we put God first and we honor God. Then what God does is He does what we've been trying to do for so long, meet all of those needs. But the byproduct of seeking God and just trusting God and and putting Him first is that God adds to our life. We don't have to worry. We don't have to be fearful. We don't have to be stressed out. So today, as we get ready to give, let's get that order right and put God first in our life. Father, as we come before you today and give, Lord, we thank you for every person in the room, Lord, that's giving today, God. I pray that you would bless them, you would provide for them, and you would increase them. And Lord, I pray for those, God, that that are in need today, God, that you would give them seed, Father, God, that you would bring provision so that they they can seek you first in their finances God and that you could bring increase in Jesus name amen today you're going to have a great day in church pastor Andre is going to be coming to preach the word of God today and I know that as you open up your heart God's got a word for you that will speak into your life come on so let's welcome pastor Andre as he comes to share God's word God as we said earlier is holy he is awesome he is great It's amazing to serve a God that is so great within our lives. And when we start getting this knowledge of who He is and and that He has actually accomplished everything that is required for us to step into relationship with Him, and we then choose to to invite Him into our life and become born again, which Pastor Donovan taught us so amazingly about last week, that we become born again and we start walking this journey and we start following Christ. And we start living a life that we, that we want to be acceptable to Him. And we start doing things that, that we know is in line with His will and His purpose. And, and on this journey, and trying to be pleasing to Him, honestly, I don't know about you, sometimes we mess up. We mess up in the process. We mess up in the process of, of how we want Him to bring glory and honor. And, and uh, it's, it's sometimes out of a, a naive ignorance of, of really what it is that, that God finds pleasing. And so we listen to a lot of voices that, that many times confuse us. And so I know that I made a lot of mistakes in my past. And I'm probably going to make a lot of mistakes in my future. Just ask my wife and uh, she'll tell you. But here today... As I'm standing here today, I want to live a life that is acceptable and honoring to God. That's what I'm aiming towards. And, and in the Bible, we see that, that God created us in an acceptable state. We sometimes forget that, that when God created the world and he created Adam and Eve and the first people, he said that it was good. He actually said it was very good. So we were created as accepted by God. The challenge is what happens is, as what happened with Adam and Eve and many times happens in our lives is they started looking at other things. And so what we read is is that when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eyes and that it was desirable for obtaining wisdom, she took the fruit and she ate it. And so what happened in that moment was they looked at something other than God that could provide for them. They looked at something other that was pleasing to them. They looked at the potential different source for wisdom. And God needs to be all of those things for us in our lives. And what they did, they placed something else bigger than God in that moment, something more important. And I can remember the the first time something similar like that happened to me was my eldest son was about six years old. And he came to me and he said, Dad, you know you are big and strong. And obviously my chest swelled up, yes, son. I'm big and strong. And he said, but you know what? I can't remember the silly kid's name. He's not a silly kid, but I can't remember the kid's name. He said to me, but so-and-so's dad is bigger. And the mud dropped. And what happened for me in that moment was I knew that from that moment on, he would not look to me for everything anymore. He would start finding other sources. And this is sometimes what happens for us when we're trying to please God. And it was really a sad day within my life, and I, and I realized that. And so this is what Adam and Eve did. There was this process where they started looking at something other than God. And throughout history, God's people have walked away from Him. With Adam and Eve, we saw that, that God warned them, you may freely eat of the fruit of every tree in the garden, but accept the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And what did they do? They ate. And so this was a repetitive process that happened within the people of of, uh, God, is that they would come to him and then they turned from him. 
We see that Joshua, uh, or brother Moses, leads them out, and they have salvation through God, and he leads them out of Egypt, but they get into the, the wilderness, and they start complaining. They start turning against God. When Moses dies, Joshua is raised up, and Joshua declares the awesome declaration that for me and my house, we will follow the Lord, and then he tells them, you need to decide who you're going to be following, and they all say, we are going to follow the Lord. But when Joshua dies, it tells us that the next generation did, forgot everything that God did, and they turned against him. And so every time they would turn against him, they would go into trouble, they would come to God, they would cry out for help, and God would supernaturally save them. And this is a continual process, and maybe you have realized that same process within your own life. And we see this pattern completed, and then what do we do? We try to follow the rules and regulations that will get us back into favor with God. We try and do all the right things so that he would see us and get us back into favor. The problem with rules and regulations are they only point out our mistakes. The Bible teaches us. If you guys will give me the Roman scripture, it says that one, no one can, be, can make, be made right Sorry, with God by following the law. The law only shows us our sin. And so when we try and fix up with God and be pleasing to him through rules and regulations, that's not gonna work. And Paul teaches us that what we need to do is whether we are here in this body or away from this body, our goal is to please God. Our goal is to live. We need to please God. So now the question is, how do I start? How do I start pleasing God? How do I start living a life that is pleasing to Him? See, there's so much information that comes at us. So much information we've bombarded with that confuse the process for us and get us confused and get us onto the wrong track. And many times this, this uh, information is so readily available to us. And the challenge is that we're trying to find things, but there are many opinions. And if you have a certain opinion that you want validated, you will find at least 10 people on the internet that will validate it for you. And that can be very dangerous for us. And so the... We find good knowledge and we find that knowledge is good for us and information is good, but it's actually very bad for us. And we find that knowledge helps us, but knowledge destroys. And it's no wonder that, that Solomon said that the increase of knowledge only increases sorrow. You see, all this information that comes at us only comes to distort the picture, only comes to confuse us, come to distract us. And then we don't know where we need to be or what it is that God has called from us. And, and in essence... It makes it difficult to find the truth. It finds tough to find the real truth. And last week, Pastor Donovan taught us there's, that truth is found in only one name, Jesus Christ. He is the way, He is the truth, and He is the life. And He is the only way to the Father. He is the only way to answers. He's the only way to hope. He's the only way that we can find and make our way back to the Father. And that is the only place where we will not be confused and where we can find uh, answers, but not find answers from the originator of lies, like Adam and Eve did. They found their answer from the father of lies. And the only thing that he does in our life is that he confuses us, he distracts us, and he misdirects us puts us into a wrong direction. And, and so we try to please God and we try to do things that is pleasing to God and uh, we mess up along the journey. And, but it's from a heart that wants to be pleasing. And so sometimes we actually mess up because we're trying to be pleasing to God. It's just we don't find it in the right places. We don't look at the right thing. And so we start asking all these questions. Am I, am I doing it on the right day of the week? Are we, are we celebrating this at the right time of the year? Is, am I using the right terminology when I'm referring to God? Am I praying the right thing? You know, my, my uh, one uncle's name was Pitt. But for some other reason, most of my life, I called him Buddha, which for the English guys, that's like bro. And so I called him Uncle Bro. Wimbuta. That was what I called it. I thought that was his name. I only found out, I think in my 30s around about there, that wasn't his name. But the fact that I referred to him as Buddha and everybody else that spoke to me about him spoke as Buddha didn't change our relationship. It didn't change the intimacy that we could have or how we could grow our relationship. It wasn't determined by that. And so 
sometimes we ask all these questions and, and we want to know, have we done enough? Have we answered enough? Am I reading the Bible enough? Am I reading the right scripture? Have I started at the right place in the Bible? Have I done enough on the day? Should I go to a Bible school so I can get a theolo theology degree in understanding the Bible? Uh, have I done too much? Have I done too little? Am I saying enough? Am I saying too little? Am I stepping out? Am I PC enough? All of these questions. And today I want to say to you, don't overcomplicate it. Slow down, take a breath, and keep it simple. Father, we are so thankful that we were created in a state that was acceptable by you, Father. That you made us the way that you want us. And Father, today as we come to you and we want to talk about how do we please you. Would you lead this discussion? Would you lead the words, Father? Would you make sure that, that what is said brings glory and honor to you, but has value in each life, Father? I pray that you would speak to each of us individually today and show us what we can do to be pleasing to you. What is it that your heart requires from us? We praise you for this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So today we want to look at this subject matter. How do we please God? How do we live a life that is pleasing to him. And maybe like you, you're asking that question, what is it that I can do? And I wanna just use this principle quick, uh, going through this teaching that we see in Matthew. It says, you parents, if your children ask you for a loaf of bread, do you give them a stone instead? Or if they ask for a fish, do you give them a snake? Of course not. So if you, imperfect as you are, know how to lovingly take care of your children and give them what is best, how much more ready is your heavenly Father to give you wonderful gifts to those who ask Him? See, the principle that we see here is, is that if, if I as an earthly father can love my children, be gracious unto them, understand their seasons and the times that they're going through, and understand the way that they are coming to me is trying to be pleasing to me, how much more will our Father know that? And how much more can my children come to me and receive from me personally and don't have to go to everybody else and be confused in the process and try and find out what I like, but if they come to me, we can build, which is the first important point, relationship. You see, we can't go into all the different things that might please God. There's obviously many variances and things that would be pleasing to God in your personal life, but there are certain overarching principles that we can look at. And if they keep these things in the right space, we know that we are living towards a life that is pleasing to God. And the first of that is relationship. Now, relationship is frustrating. Relationship is confusing. Relationship uh, sometimes distracts us. But when relationship is grown, when relationship is focused on, it can be so pleasing. And so God wants to be in relationship with each of us. He wants to be in a personal relationship with each of us, and he, and he yearns for that relationship. And so we want to grow in relationship with God. And Jesus was our ultimate example of what relationship should look like. And he said, it says about him that for the joy set before him, he endured the cross. In another scripture, Jesus says that if you're tired and weary, come unto me, and I will give you rest. So what was Jesus indicating here is that, that his relationship with us is a giving relationship. It is an imparting relationship. It's a sharing with you. We call it a covenant relationship. And, and that is the relationship that God yearns to be in with us, is in a covenant relationship. And he already showed us that by giving his son for us. Now, in general, I want to say that there might be two types of relationships we want to look at. The, the one relationship is a give and take kind of relationship. It's born out of the gain that there can be for both sides and, and the extent of the relationship, the intensity of the relationship, and maybe the length of the relationship will be, turn, be determined by the gain that there can be crosswise in that kind of relationship. But then there's this kind of relationship that God has with us, that's a covenant relationship. Covenant relationship talks about a commitment, an investment, a giving of myself into the relationship, a giving that has a gain for the other rather than necessarily for me. In Hebrews we learn that may he equip you with all you need for doing his will and that you will always be eager to do right and may Jesus help you do what pleases 
God. What he says there is that, that God will show us how to do his will, not my will. That I come to please him, not for him to please me. I want to be in a covenant relationship where I bring for him. That is the kind of relationship that is pleasing to God. And, and how do I accomplish this to, to have this kind of relationship? Well, I need to come with a submitted heart. A submitted heart in obedience. Now, let's be honest. In today's society, we don't like those two words. Obedience and submission. It is not great. Because it's been abused so many times. But I want to remind you that our father is a perfect father. He's a loving father. He's gracious and merciful. And he would never use those things against us. He uses those things to grow us. He uses them to grow in things. And, and uh, the prophet Samuel says to King Saul that, listen, obedience is better than sacrifice. And submission is better than offering. You see, what Saul was doing was not necessarily a bad thing. He wasn't necessarily to bring the offering, wasn't necessarily a bad thing that he did in that moment. But he didn't do it from a submitted heart, and he didn't do it in line with God's will and the process that God had put in place. And so sometimes we can have the actions that we bring that are supposed to be pleasing to God, but we're doing it from our will or our benefit. And it's not in line with what God's will is. And so we need to come with a submitted heart that we want to honor God. And we want to do his will, the way that he described, the way that he put it forward. And why does God want us to do that? Because when we apply his will, when we apply his principles, when we do things his way, our lives are better. And that's the heart of every father. He wants to see our lives be better. And so with applying God's principles, when we come in submission and obedience to him, our lives become better. And so in submission and, and, and obedience, when we, when we come in submission and obedience, it says that we trust him. We trust his character, we trust his promises, and we trust his principles. That we will do his will, we will do things his way, so that we can be pleasing to him. Because we trust him in this process. See, as I said earlier, it's so dangerous to go and look for information of how to do things out there. And, and if there isn't somebody that's going to tell you on the internet what you want to hear that will be tingling to your ears, somebody will ask AI to create it for you. And so we need to be careful what we lend our ears to. And be careful. I believe that God has placed us in the place that we need to be, when we need to be there, with the people and the leadership that he planned for us to have. And when we search outside of that, we might get confused. We might get information that will distract us and mislead us. It will put us into a place where the enemy can have a royal time with us. God gives peace, and we raised our Lord Jesus Christ from death. Now Jesus is like a great shepherd whose blood was used to make God's eternal agreement with his flock. That's each of you. I pray that God will make you ready to obey him and that you will always be eager to do right. And may Jesus help you do what pleases God, to Jesus Christ be the glory forever and ever. You see, many times we, get, we miss the mark because we are misdirected by the enemy. And so we do things, but not necessarily things that are pleasing to God. See, the enemy wants to get us off track. And what he does is, and he is very sly in this, he'll give us just a little bit misinformation, just to get us a little bit off track. Now, if my aim is there, and this is a little bit that I'm off track, it seems like nothing wrong. Of course, it's just a little bit. But by the time I get to the end, I'm very far off track. And so this is what he does. And so we listen to the wrong information. We give our attention to the wrong people. We want to be too PC. We want to fit into social culture. We want to be part of all of these things. And so we get misdirected a little bit. And then eventually we end up in a space where we go, what happened? God, I was trusting you. I was believing in you. I had faith in you. I was following you. But where am I at now? What has happened? What has brought me here? And what has happened is a ways back, we were misdirected just a little bit. And this is not pleasing to God. And so he wants us to be focused on his will. John writes of Jesus, and, he will and we will receive from him whatever we ask because we obey him and do the things that pleases him. 
Now, the enemy, as I said, is sly in this misdirection. And one of the areas where he easily misdirects us is in faith. Yes, faith. We need faith. We need to live by faith. In actual fact, the word says to us that without faith, no one can please God. We need to live by faith. But the question today is, where is my faith focused? Where am I focusing on when I have faith? You see, I think it was Pastor Donovan that taught us that, that fear is having faith in the enemy's ability. Where's my faith focused? Is my, is my faith currently in a space that says that what could go wrong is probably more, more chance that it's gonna happen than what will go right? Is my faith that the enemy's plan for my life will probably happen more so than Jesus' plan for my life? Where is my faith focused? Am I allowed my faith to be distracted? And then, what, what, am, I, what am I having faith for? Am, am I having, or what kind of a faith do I have? Do I, do I have a faith that is because of, or do I have a faith that is so that? A because of kind of faith is the faith that comes to God because he loved me, because he's gave, given his son for me, because Jesus gave his life for me, because he has promises on my life, because he's been merciful, because he has been gracious, because he has always been with me, that's why I have faith in him. A so that kind of faith is a faith that says, I have faith in God so that he will supply this, so that he will come through for me. My faith is focused so that I will get more from God, so that I will have a better position, so that my family will benefit. And, and God wants all these things for us. There's no, there's no uh, challenge with having these hopes and dreams within our life. But when my faith is focused on those things, it's distracted. And a pleasing faith to God is a because of faith. Because of everything he's already done for me. He doesn't have to do anything more again. He's already done everything I need. He's accomplished eternal life for me. It's been set. My salvation can't be changed. His love for me can't be changed. It's all been set already. And so I have a faith because of, not so that. And so what this speaks of is the motive of our heart. You see, our, our, the moat or what we want or what we guide before is, is, is led within our hearts. And so motive speaks of what's going on within my heart. And Jeremiah says this, that the human heart is most deceitful of all things and desperately wicked. Who can really know how bad it is? Jesus said, for from the heart comes evil thoughts, murder, adultery, all sexual immorality, theft, lying, and slander. And so the question today is, what is the motive of my heart? Why am I drawn towards God? Why am I in a relationship with Him? Is it for everything that I want Him to do? Or is it to magnify Him? See, I can be in a relationship with God, and I can worship Him, and I can have faith in Him because I want to magnify Him in my life. I want to make Him bigger in my life. But if I'm really honest, sometimes when it gets misdirected, I actually want Him to magnify me. I want me to be the most important. I want him to be constantly focused on me. And I know as a father's heart, that's what it is. But my role is to magnify him. A motive that is pleasing to God is a motive that wants to magnify him, that wants to make him greater and bigger within my life. So I have a because of faith, because of what he's already done for me. And when I have this kind of a heart, it's easy for gratitude to start growing in my heart. It's easy to desire to please him. It becomes easier to answer to the call and, and to accomplish the purpose that he's put on my life and, and to bring him glory and honor. It's, it all flows from this type of a heart. And the truth is today that only God and I know what's always happening in my heart. Only us can figure out. And unfortunately, sometimes we've lied so much to ourselves that we even struggle to know what's happening, really happening in our hearts. Or maybe because we don't like the answer that's gonna come out. And so the psalmist says, create in me a clean heart, O God. Renew a loyal spirit within me. The fountain of your pleasure is found in the sacrifice of my shattered heart before you. You will not despise my tenderness as I humbly bow down at your feet. So what do I need to do? We come to God 
and we ask him to search us. We ask him to look into our heart. We ask him to show what is in there. This is what David did. David said, examine me and know my mind. Test me and know all my worries. Make sure that I'm not going the wrong way. Lead me on the path that has already been, that has always been right. And point out anything in me that offends you and lead me along the path of everlasting life. I think this continually needs to be a, a prayer of a follower of Christ, that I ask God to search me, look within me. Have I, have I been diverted? Have I been misled? Have I, has my focus gone? Have I started going into a relationship that's all about the gain that I can get and no longer about what I can bring to the relationship? Has, my, has I lost my obedience and my submission? Have I put that aside? Or, or has my motive changed? Is my faith only because I want things from you? But would you search me, God? Would you show me these things? And would you help me then to fix those? So we can see what a misdirected faith is not necessarily pleasing to God. Then what is a pleasing faith? A pleasing faith to God is what says that without faith, no one can please God. Why? Because whoever comes to God must believe that he is real and that he is a rewarder of those who sincerely try to find him. And that he cares enough to respond to those who seek him. You see, this is, a, this is a, a reliance on God. This is a, a faith in God that says, God, you see me. You see that I'm trying to get close to you. And I'm going to do all to seek you out. I'm going to do all to find. I'm going to get into your word and I'm going to study to find out who you are. Study what it is you want me to submit to. Study to find out what the relationship is that you want from me. I'm going to endeavor to do the things that are pleasing to you. Not because of what you're going to do for me. Because of my thankful heart. Because of what you've already done for me. I want to grow in relationship with you. I want to draw closer to you. I want to know more about you. Because I love you and I'm thankful for everything you've done for me, not for the gain that I'm going to get from it. Faith is pleasing to God. When a faith is focused on the fact that he is real, we believe that he is real, that he exists in other words, and that he will reward those that diligently seek him. And so that is amazing news for those that are here in the house today that want to please God and seeking our ways to please him. If we seek him, he will reward us. I love this quote by John Piper. He said, God is most glorified in us when we are most satisfied in him. God is most glorified in us when we are most satisfied in him. If, if he, uh, hopefully you won't be upset with me if I just change it a little bit around to suit where we are today. God is most pleased by me when I am most pleased by him. And so I, I, I want to let God know that I'm so thankful for what he's already done for me. Now, God does answer prayers, and he does want us to pray. I'm not saying that we don't pray, but it's with the heart that we come. Is it that relationship that's gimme, gimme, gimme? Or is it what can I bring? And know that God is good, and that he brings all things together for those that are called according to his purposes. What I'm about to say is sometimes tough to hear. But I think it's important as we allow God to search our heart and to look inside what is there. The challenge for us today is that we live in a society where the expectation is that you will only be concerned for your own benefit and well-being. That is the expectation from society. You will realize if you open your eyes and your hearts, you will realize that people deal with you from the expectation that you will only want your own benefit. That's the society we're in. And the thought of living or dying for someone else's benefit is totally countercultural. So what happens? We make shallow relationships where we can engage for our own benefit, but not be overly committed to the cost of the relationship, where we are able to easily get out of the relationship as cost-effectively as possible and attach to another relationship where I can have a short-term benefit. This might be one of the reasons why social media is so popular. Because with social media, I can have a non-committed relationship. And it only demonstrates 
our inability to give our life for someone else, especially when it's going to cost me or deliver no benefit for myself. And some of you are looking at me and go, really, is that what you expect from us? That I'm supposed to be in a relationship for the other's benefit, not for myself? Yes, that is the relationship that is pleasing to God. That is what God did for us. He gave without any benefit. Jesus gave his life before he ever knew if one of us was gonna choose him and follow him. He still gave his life for each of us. It's about being in a relationship with the benefit of others as the main goal, especially when it comes to our relationship with God. This is what's pleasing to God. What will we need be needed from us to be able to walk in these things and these principles we've spoken about today is a faithfulness. Faithfulness is a character of God. Solomon says this, he replied and he said, you show much loving devotion to your servant, my father David, because he walked before you in faithfulness, righteousness, and uprightness. He walked in faithfulness and with integrity before God. That means an open, humble, honesty before God. Search me, show me what is in me that is not pleasing to you. And faithfulness is a characteristic of God. It's a characteristic that he has. It's a characteristic that he chose for himself. It's a characteristic that he searches for, and it's a characteristic that is pleasing to him. Paul teaches Timothy and says that even when we are unfaithful or faithless, he will remain faithful, for he cannot deny who he is. It's about being in a relationship, not for what I can earn or get, but a relationship where I can bring all I have because of everything that has been done for me. I don't have to go find what kind of language to use, what kind of platform to be on. I don't have to find out what is the right day for celebrating his birth or which is the right day of the week to do stuff or how many times I need to read the Bible or how intense it needs to be. All of those things might be great, but none of that is what he's searching from us. He's searching from a heart that is towards him. See, the question that I have to ask myself, and these are tough questions, is how long will my faith last if he never answers a prayer again? And will I remain faithful through every storm and every wilderness that I go through? What will my faith do? Those are questions we have to answer for ourselves, and maybe it explains to us a little bit if I read into things what might have happened between Martha and Mary. Maybe Martha had a so that relationship with Jesus. Maybe she was concerned about everything she needed to do because it would gain her favor with Jesus. It would show him what all the things that she could do and, and how she could be well prepared and, and how she could bring everything so that she would buy favor from him in the process. And that's why Mary's attitude frustrated her. She was judgmental towards it. She pointed fingers towards it because she had a potentially so that relationship and not a because of Jesus. And so we need to appreciate people that God has put into our lives and live for their benefit because of the pleasure of having them within our lives. Just quickly, the last point and the last thing that I believe that really pleases God is unity. The psalmist teaches us that how wonderful and how beautiful when brothers and sisters get along. It is like the dew on Mount Hermon. Yes, that's where God commands the blessing and ordains eternal life. And as we said before, that society has a, a, or creates a space that is all for self-gain and all for me. And unity is tough. You can't really live in unity with other people when it's all about you because you're consistently gonna look at what your gain is gonna be with it and not unify for an external goal. And this unity functions best under leadership. And so we saw that continually with God through history that every time his people turned against him, they cried out, he raised up a leader, he united them, and then that leader took them on to victory. And so when we unite, there's principles available to us. There's this principle that speaks about one can put a thousand to flight, but two can put 10,000 to flight. 
So there's exponential authority and blessing available to us when we dwell together in unity. And when we, for instance, as a church, unite around a common vision that we believe has been given to us by our leadership, and we work towards that, and God sees the unity, this scripture tells us that there he commands the blessing. And that's what we want to see on our lives, in our friendships, in our families, in our workspaces. We want to see God's blessing. And the way that we get that blessing is that we are pleasing to him as being united. My boys are pleasing to me when they unite. And when they unite in requesting from me, they get most what they ask for. Because I love to see them work together. And I really love when one is willing to pay a sacrifice for the other without getting any gain for themselves. This touches my heart. If it touches my heart, how much more must it touch the Father's heart? Paul says, For I fully expect and I hope that I will never be ashamed, but that I will continue to be bold for Christ, as I have been in the past, and I trust that my life will bring honor to Christ, wherever, whether I live or whether I die. For me, Living means living for Christ, and dying is even better. But if I live, I can do more and be more fruitful for Christ. The psalmist says that he takes no pleasure in the strength of horse or men, so we can't brag about the things that we do. No, the Lord's delight is in those who fear him, in those who put their hope in his unfailing love. So what are we saying today? What are these overarching things that helps us be pleasing to God? Is that we yearn for a relationship where we bring, where we commit ourselves, even if there's a cost to it, that I will give myself to you and I will do everything I can to better you. I'm gonna challenge you that you do everything you can in your workspace to make the person next to you get the promotion and see if that's pleasing to God where I'm in a relationship for the other one's benefit, that I come with submitted obedience to God, looking for His will above my will, trying to be pleasing to Him in obedience to the way that He has given His instruction and apply His principles according to that, that I have a faith that is because of, because of everything He's done for me. I trust and believe in Him, that my motive is pure, that I allow him to search my heart and show me if there's anything that is not pleasing to him so that I can continue being pleasing to him and, and that I'll work on getting rid of those things and refocus my life on the things that he has called me to, that I will learn to be faithful, that I will stick in the storm, whether that's in my relationship with God or the relationship of those that I have within my life, that I will stay consistent, that I will stay connected, that I will stay committed and that I will unite with my brothers and sisters in Christ, unite under a common vision, and that we're gonna be expectant for God's blessing to be on that, and that we will see everything being turned for the good, and that we will see the results that will grow the kingdom and bring glory and honor to Him, and that He will be magnified, and that my focus will be on bringing Him all of that praise. You see today, all of this is only possible if I actually step into that born again relationship. And being pleasing to him is only accomplished once I start applying his principles and not my own. So that means I have to hand my life over to him. I have to say, I'm no longer gonna try and work it out. You've already done it for me. You've paid the price. And so I choose to accept you as my Lord and my savior. I choose to follow you. And I don't know where you are in your life. Maybe you've made that decision. But we don't want to just accept that. So I'm going to give you an opportunity today to make that choice, to invite Jesus Christ in as your personal Lord and Savior. So I'm going to ask if everybody can just bow their head for a second. If you have never made that decision to invite Him into your life, and if this pure kind of relationship that is focused on Him, then today I want to give you the opportunity to make that choice. I'm going to be counting to three. 
And when I get to three, I want you to just wave your hand at me. I'm not going to call you out, not going to embarrass you in any way. Just want to know that you want to be part of the prayer that we're going to pray and that you want to show God that today is that day. Or maybe, you know, maybe life has happened. You made that choice before in your life to accept Him as your Lord and Savior, but stuff has happened. And we've been misdirected. And we've started doing things that's outside of His will and plan. And today you want to come back and recommit your life to Him. If of any of those two, I'm going to ask that you raise your hand. One, Today is the day. Today is the day for salvation. Two, three. Raise your hand if you want to be part of that prayer. Hands going up all over. Don't miss out on this moment. Don't let it go past. Use this opportunity to either accept Him as your Lord and Savior or to come back to Him today. Father, you see each of these hands. We know that you look to the heart, Father. And so you see the heart of each person that has their hands raised. Today we commit our lives to you. We are so thankful for what Jesus did on the cross for us to accomplish eternal life. Thank you that you love each person, that you have plans and purposes for each person's life, Father. And today as we commit our lives to you, would you come in, would you take control? We choose to do things your way and not our own. And so we follow you completely. We thank you that you saved us and we accept you as our Lord and Savior. Praise you, we glorify you, we thank you that you are an awesome, loving God. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Let's give them a hand. If you made that decision, whether it's a first time or a recommitment and and you want to get on this journey and, and you want to start living a life that's pleasing to him and following him and you need some more information about the choice that you've made then please when you go out the door to the left that next steps area the guys are there i know they're excited to chat with you go and talk to them and they can help you out with what can you next step maybe be in your relationship with god let's stand you guys good is god good is he working all things together for the good do we trust him today do we hand our lives to him we're going to try endeavor to live a life that is pleasing, not be confused by all those voices out there. I want to reiterate, God knew you. He had plans for you. And so he would have placed you in the place where you need to be in the season that you needed to be there. Trust him and learn from that. Don't be confused by all the different things that are out there. It's the enemy's tool to confuse us. So let's pray. Father, we want to be focused on your word, your truth. Would you please show us if there's things in our life where we've allowed misdirection of the enemy to come in, where we've walked away from your plan and purpose. And Father, we never want to not be pleasing to you. So if there's anything within us, in our actions, in our words, in our heart, in our plans, in our purposes that are not pleasing to you, would you show us and would you help us get it back in line in jesus name amen amen awesome have an amazing week bless somebody in your life and let them know that jesus loves them